So there are a ton of videos out there to review AP World History by unit, which are fantastic. I even have some of my own, you can go check them out. But this video is going to focus on one specific region, the Middle East, from the beginning of the course all the way to the end, help pull together all those times you touch down in the region throughout the year. Again, we don't want you feeling like AP World is doing this to you. <laughs> whipping you around like the time I took an even younger version of that same child on the holiday version of the teacups at Six Flags, which is not like the Disney teacups. So if AP World is making you feel a little disoriented and maybe seeing double, this video on the Middle East is for you. First things first. The Middle East is technically in Asia. If you look at this very fancy College Board map, you'll notice that it's Southwest Asia. And it includes this area of Egypt, which again, this whole region together of the Middle East has very similar cultural commonalities, similar language spoken, they're predominantly Muslim, and some more nuanced in-depth reasons that we're not gonna get to in this video. So now that you know where we're talking about, let's jump into what you need to know by starting with some basic context of the region. First of all, all three monotheistic religions of the world emerged in the Middle East, Judaism and Christianity first, and then with Islam emerging in the Arabian Peninsula in the 600s with Muhammad being its final prophet. He went on to unify the people in that region as Islam really was that unifier. And then it expanded into Northern Africa. After the death of Muhammad, the Islamic community was ruled under the four rightly guided caliphs. The caliph really being that term to describe both the political and the spiritual leader all wrapped up in one. The Umayyad Caliphate and then the Abbasid Caliphate will be the empires in this region. Now remember, the Middle East was the happening place. If you were to name the place where a center of learning was, where new technologies were coming from, it would be the Middle East. Or of course, even starts in the year 1200. Baghdad in modern day Iraq was where you'd find the House of Wisdom. It was the intellectual academy where the brightest people in the world would come together and make advances in astronomy and in medicine and other research. They translated old Greek and Roman works into Arabic and they were building on that previous knowledge. And a little bit more context to get you set up. We know that the Europeans and Muslims collided in the Crusades in 1099 in Jerusalem and religion wasn't the only difference as Europe was living its best decent centralized, archaic life at this time. But this collision with the Crusades will reverberate throughout history. By the year 1200, where our course begins, the era of state building and the rise of trade networks, we will see the Islamic Abbasid Empire really starting to decline and start to fragment and break apart as it was difficult to maintain unity over such a large empire. Turkic groups began to emerge like the Seljuk Turks and the Mamluks in Egypt, and they're all disrupting the Abbasid's unity. And the Abbasid Empire just declines and eventually will fall when the Mongols conquer their capital city of Baghdad in 1258. Again, this is the story where one of Chinggis is Khan's grandsons take over. They told the Caliph Mustasim to surrender. He refuses. They roll him up in a carpet and trample him with their horses to not shed royal blood. This marked the end of the Islamic Golden Age in Baghdad. Now, the Mongols were less familiar with the vast administrative systems established in the former Islamic empires, and they also ruined a lot of the local geography due to the overgrazing of the Mongols' animals. However, don't forget that the period of 1200 to 1450 also marked the rise of trade networks. So let's connect the dots on that. Because the Mongols became the largest contiguous land empire in all of history, it connected most of the Silk Road network in Asia. This was known as the Pax Mongolica or Mongolian peace. This made the Silk Road incredibly safe from external threats and it allowed for the significant moving of goods and religion and also disease. I'm looking at you, Black Death. The bubonic plague made its pit stop throughout the Middle East before it landed on mainland Europe in 1347. This led to the decline of the Ilkhanate, the Mongols who were ruling in the Middle East, and the Seljuk Turks, which then paved a way for a new group to unify and form in this region. Osman Bey will not know that his kind of meager beginnings will lead to an empire, the Ottoman Empire, that will last during this time all the way to World War I but it's going to. So how does Osman Bey build this new state? Well, he's gonna to begin to unify the area of Anatolia or modern day Turkey, and he will engage in military conquests to unify the region with the aid of his Ghazi warriors. 
And this, my friends, will shift us into the next historical period of the course, the years of 1450 to 1750, the era of large land-based empires and the rise of European maritime empires. The Ottomans are going to be one of the most prominent land-based empires of this unit, and I think a BFF of the College Board, just like I talked about the Mughals in South Asia, you will for sure see the Ottomans on your AP exam. Now the Ottomans centralized their political control over time with their leader of their empire being called the Sultan. It is very much an absolute monarchy with the Sultan having absolute say over political, judicial, and religious realms. In this case, that religion being Islam. Another powerful role within the system were viziers, who were high-ranking political advisors in the bureaucracy with the grand vizier, who would be basically over all of them. Additionally, there are two other important terms that you have to have to know about the Ottomans, Devshirme and the Janissaries. The system of Devshirme is a system where the Sultan staffed their military and their government through it. The unique part of the system is who the people were that they used to staff these positions. They were young Christian boys from the neighboring areas in the Balkans. They were recruited by force, and seen as tribute from these neighboring areas. With the Devshirme system, if boys were more athletic, they had the muscles, they would be shifted to go into the Janissaries, the elite fighting force of the Ottoman army. And if they were more intellectually astute, they would then be sent to work in government positions. Now, all the boys were then indoctrinated to be fiercely loyal to the Sultan, and since they had no hereditary ties, there was no way that you could challenge the Sultan's line of succession. The key sultans to remember in the period of 1450 to 1750 would be Mehmet the Conqueror, who would conquer the city of Constantinople right as we start this historical period in 1453. Their use of gunpowder would be extensive with their gigantic basilic cannon, and they would make the city fall within 55 days. The city's name was then changed to Istanbul as we know it today. However, Ottoman conquest did not end there, and it continued after Mehmed with his grandson Selim I, who came to power in 1512. Istanbul became the center of the Islamic civilization during this time. However, Selim did have significant conflicts with the Safavid Empire, where the Ottomans were really just ahead of them technologically with their modern gunpowder weapons and their advanced infantry tactics of the Janissaries. But the Safavids were another Islamic land empire in the Middle East in modern day Iran during the time. And we're gonna come back to them in just a minute. So another important leader though of the Ottomans would be Suleiman the Magnificent, who led after Selim. He continued to build up the military in the Devshirme system, which again answers that question about political centralization. How did the empires maintain and centralize their political power? Well, in this case, a strong military with the use of gunpowder supported by the Devshirme system, as well as having this really big administrative system. Suleiman will also support the arts and he'll commission the Suleimani Mosque, again, another way to legitimize your rule, build big stuff. However, as time passed, the Ottomans transformed and adapted as they shifted more power to the viziers, as we will see power becoming less concentrated in the capital city, and then more throughout the empire. As a multi-ethnic, multi-religious empire, power was granted to millets. These millets were predominantly Christian or Jewish communities. And the phrase millet even comes right from the Quran and refers to specifically the people of the book. Millets under the Ottomans became these self-governing religious communities that had their own laws and were headed by a religious leader and were still responsible though to the Ottoman government. They had to pay their taxes and they were in charge of their own security. But let's not forget about the rival next door of the Ottomans, the Safavid Empire. The Safavid Empire was founded by Shah Ismail and he ruled starting in 1501 in modern day Iran. The Safavid Empire was hugely influenced by Persian culture. It too was established by military conquest and they had a strong centralized state. The leader though here was known as a Shah, which essentially again means emperor king. The primary religion used in the Safavid empire was also Islam, but specifically Shia Islam. Remember the key differences between Sunni and Shia involved succession disagreements. After the death of Muhammad, Sunnis believed that the future caliph should be chosen from the community. Whereas the Sunni Muslims believed that the caliph should be chosen from the bloodline of Muhammad. Now, not only were the Ottomans and the Safavids religious rivals, Sunni and Shia, they were also in conflict over land. And as we see during this era of 
land-based empires. Shah Ishmael will not utilize artillery in the fight against the Ottomans, but rather will use these traditional weapons, curved swords, his best steel armor and mail, and a wood fight with a cavalry. For my less military-minded friends, a cavalry is basically a military force mounted on horseback. The Ottomans will win, but again, if you're looking at more information about this battle, the Battle of Chaldaran will be the one that you want to look into more. Now, later Shah Abbas I will rule from 1588 to 1629, and he will shift the Safavid Empire into a more of a gunpowder empire. But not only were there conflicts over religion and land disputes, but there's also these additional conflicts about money. Who is controlling those overland trade routes, especially the connection to the Silk Road as they connected Asia to Europe? The Safavid Empire will decline towards the end of this period and is replaced by another dynasty not really discussed at all in this class or in the CED, uh, really until later in this course again we'll come back to this region. Remember this period is also marked by some major shifts with these rising maritime empires, the Portuguese, the Spanish, the British, the Dutch, the French, all arising between 1450 and 1750, which will challenge these overland routes and the economic power that the Middle East really has had for quite some time. This brings us to the next time period of our course, 1750 to 1900. Remember, this is the era that's focused on political revolutions, the Industrial Revolution, and imperialism. Now, the biggest ways that those shifts in history will impact the Middle East will probably be the Industrial Revolution and how it affects the region. We will see a steep decline in Middle Eastern manufacturing as it shifts to Europe. The same is true of textile production in Egypt, or the intricate rugs that were made throughout the Middle East that were harder to sell when you had British and Americans who could produce those same types of goods faster and much cheaper. All of this, combined with the growth of maritime trade, will continue to impact the revenue that the overland routes are able to charge through taxes in both the Ottoman and the Safavid empires as more people are going by sea. Now, all of these events will lead to the prominence of the Ottoman Empire beginning to dwindle, as they will wrestle with how to really deal with these new realities. Mahmud II was the Ottoman Sultan who ruled from 1808 to 1836. He will lead some reforms to attempt to revitalize the Ottomans. But not everyone likes change. I mean, do you remember like with a big deal with the Starbucks lids that were kind of like sippy cups? or other restaurants that got rid of straws altogether. I mean, people, it was a big deal. People aren't huge fans of change. So he chose to eliminate the Janissaries. Wait, what? Like the military? No, no, no. He wanted to eliminate the old school military they had in favor of a new modern Western style military. And the Janissaries, you know, losing their jobs, much less, I mean, this really mirrors the very similar story that we saw in Japan. You can go check out that video as well uh, with the samurai. But again, the Janissaries were not a big fan of modernizing their military. They totally tried to revolt and he had them massacred. Later reforms in this area that you probably learned about were the Tanzimat reforms. These are changes that were carried out between 1839 and 1870 in the Ottoman Empire, as this really attempt at modernizing to stop the decline of their empire. They focused a wide variety of changes, such as secular schools instead of religious ones guided by the ulama. They updated their law codes. They had a desire to get rid of the corruption in the government. And they also made changes to the millet system, where Christians and Jews had a lot of freedom in the past, now have less autonomy, as as they were required to really fall under the Ottoman legal umbrella. Most reforms emerged to address the declining Ottoman Empire, and one of those groups were the Young Ottomans. They desired to have a constitution and a focus on loyalty to the state versus some sort of autocratic leader. Much of their goals were influenced by the Enlightenment and the ideals of the French Revolution. But many also wanted modernization and Islamic values really to stay front and center. The bigger reforms, though, came from another group known as the Young Turks, who had some similarities to the Young Ottomans. They, too, were opposed to authoritarian regime of the Ottoman Sultan Abdul Hamid II, and they really wanted a constitution and a parliament. They focused on this Turkish nationalism, making Turkish the official language, and essentially making sure that the empire really revolved around this Turkish identity. It was evident by the late 1800s that the value of nationalism and national identity was spreading all around the world. Now, as we shift to the final time period of this course, 1900 to present, there is a lot going down here in the Middle East. We're gonna talk about the world wars, the Cold War, and globalization, all that have major, major impacts in this region. Now, the Ottomans gained a nickname, 
the sick man of Europe to describe their economic difficulties in comparison to other European nations. Remember, Istanbul is in Europe, so even though you're probably thinking of them just in the Middle East, they're technically also there. Now, during World War I, the Ottomans fought on the side of the Austro-Hungarian Empire and Germany. If you were to glance at a map, geographically, the Austro-Hungarian Empire and the Ottomans were physically very close to each other. Plus, they had an economic relationship with the Germans. They even desired to create a Berlin to Baghdad rail system. Now, remember that group that we talked about before, the Young Turks? Well, now they are incredibly influential during World War I as they plan to Turkify the empire, focusing on one religion, one language, one people. Well, within the Ottoman Empire, there was also a group called the Armenians, an ethnic group that was not Turkish, that didn't speak Turkish, and they weren't even Muslim. In 1915, during World War I, the Armenian Genocide began. The Turkish government arrested and executed several hundred Armenian intellectuals, and then targeted ordinary Armenians who were taken from their homes and set on death marches throughout the Syrian desert without food or water. Most sources agree that there were somewhere between 2 million Armenians before the genocide, and by 1922, there was about 400,000 Armenians left within the Ottoman Empire. Now, we know that the Central Powers will lose World War I, and this will lead to the fall of the Ottoman Empire. The partitioning, or breaking apart, of the Ottoman Empire brought international conflicts at the Paris Peace Conference in 1919. Fast forward a bit, uh, the newly created League of Nations creates the Mandate System. Under this system, the victors of World War I, places like Britain and France, were given responsibility for governing former Ottoman territories as mandates from the League, with this end goal of their eventual independence. But they were kind of like, they're not ready yet. They need more training from more advanced European nations. Man, just sounds like a lot like colonization. It was. And it sounds a lot like a civilizing mission and white man's burden. And again, really driven by, oh, what is that again? Money. And so we'll start seeing Western influence economic interests in this region. Check out this map of the mandate system. You can see just how much this will influence modern history as we know it in this region. So I teach global studies uh, and I spend basically almost a full semester on modern Middle East and what I'm about to cover in the next few minutes on this video. So buckle up. Here is the very shortened version of what I do in a whole semester. We can totally do this. We're gonna drop into a lot of different places. Here we go. Let's start in the region of Palestine, where we will find the holiest city of Jerusalem, which all three monotheistic religions claim as important to their religions. Add in the sketchy colonization, I mean mandate system, um, and tensions between Jews and Muslims will increase greatly during this time, especially with the Balfour Declaration of 1917, which stated that there should be a Jewish homeland in Palestine. This land historically was the home of the Jewish people, but for nearly 1,500 years, it was also home to Muslims, most recently under the Ottoman Empire. Now, nothing really happens with the Balfour Declaration, but then World War II happens. Sympathy for the Jewish homeland increases significantly after people heard what happened in the Holocaust. Britain tried to balance both Arab and Palestinian interests with these horrors that we just saw with the Jewish people. The newly created United Nations creates two states, Israel for Jewish people and Palestine as an Arab country, which consisted of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. But that's not the end of the story. War breaks out pretty much immediately. Israel was and is still today supported by the United States and Palestine is supported by neighboring Arab countries. The short version of this conflict is Israel wins that war and hundreds of thousands of Palestinians become refugees. Add in three more wars that were really significant between 1956 and 1973. When looking at the map today and the original UN partition plan and what the map looks like today, you will see that Israel has increased in size and Palestine has decreased in size. Now the story of Israel, the creation of a new state and the redrawing of political boundaries, which leads to conflict and population displacement is an illustrative example for 8.6, newly independent states, so make sure you know about that. Now, Syria was also freed from the mandate system and gained independence as a new state in 1945 after World War II. There was a very quick period where they were besties with Egypt, but overall, the Assad family has been ruling in Syria since 1970. 
2011 will mark the beginning of their civil war during the Arab Spring, which left Syria very fragmented, with many foreign players involved, such as Russia, who supports Bashar al-Assad. Now, you also have to remember that post-World War II, the Cold War was occurring, and that influences so many of the actions of both the United States and the Soviet Union around the world, and this will be also true in Egypt which is a part of the Middle East. They were nominally independent under the Ottomans, but gained a full independence after the end of World War I as an independent kingdom in 1922. After World War II, the king was then overthrown by Gamal Abdel Nasser, who would then become president of the Republic of Egypt. He was really key in this leading of this pan-Arab movement, which really focused on unifying Islam and Arab culture in the region. Nasser combined Islam with socialism, in which he pushed for the nationalization of the Suez Canal. Controlling the canal was basically controlling the gate to so much of the world trade and how you can tax people. European control of the canal felt like imperialism, and so Nasser seized the canal. This kicked off the Suez Crisis, which led Israel to invade on behalf of the French and the British. Eventually, the United Nations got involved and brokered a deal to make the canal international waters under the control of Egypt. Luckily, the United States and the Soviet Union did not get involved with all those Cold War hot button terms involved, and the resolution was mostly peaceful. Iran is another example of how the Cold War influenced Western actions in the Middle East. For example, during World War II, when the United States, Brits, and Soviets were all besties fighting Hitler, they invaded Iran, the era formerly known as the Persian Empire and later the Safavid Empire, because they were concerned that the Shah was about to become besties with Hitler. And together, they ensured his son, Mohammad Reza Pahlavi, took the throne as the new Shah of Iran. But then the war was over, and the Cold War began, and the Iranian people didn't like how the United States was so involved in who was the leader of their country, and they forced the Shah to flee Iran. Two years later, they elected Mohammad Mossadegh as prime minister, who pushed to nationalize the oil industry. The British, you know, BP, the gas station, British Petroleum, disliked this plan because it would cost them a lot of money. So covertly, you know, secretly, like with MI6 and the CIA, they decided to overthrow Mossadegh, democratically elected Mossadegh, uh, because of, you know, money. And again, this idea of nationalization, and it's the Cold War, and we don't like anything that sounds like communism. So the United States and Britain worked together to have the democratically elected Mossadegh removed and brought the Shah back to Iran. Doesn't really feel good, guys. Anyways, the Shah did some progressive things and some repressive things. He did help with land distribution where the government bought land from landowners and sold it cheaper to peasants, which again, this is an illustrative example for 8.4, which talks about redistribution of resources. Additionally, he pushed for modernization and foreign investment, and this was known as the White Revolution because it was bloodless. But the Shah has his opponents. The big ones, landowners, not a big fan of selling off their land. And number two, the Shia religious elite who were very opposed to this Western looking Shah who was ruling the country because of the West. Now, we're gonna skip a lot of details, but this will lead to the Iranian revolution of 1979 where the Ayatollah Khomeini pushed Iran back into an Islamic Republic focused on Shia Islam. Now, I will not miss this opportunity to push yet another great historical movie on you, and that is Argo with Ben Affleck, to learn more about the Iranian Revolution. But essentially, the revolution breaks out, and they take the U.S. Embassy in Tehran. 52 Americans were held hostage for 444 days, which sets up a lot of context for the United States' relationship with Iran today. Again, you need to understand the past to understand today, and so we can all write a better tomorrow. And this is one of those situations. One more final note about the Middle East is how we look at the region today from a Western perspective, which you may or may not come from. But we think about two major things. One, we think about the prominence of oil in the Middle East, and we think about terrorism with the rise of Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State. Now, first of all, 9.1 wants you to know about energy technology, specifically about the use of petroleum and how that raised productivity and increased the production of material goods. Now, petroleum has been the largest energy source for Americans. Gasoline is the most consumed petroleum product in the United States. We use petroleum also to heat our houses and produce electricity. In fact, the United States, our single country, consumes 20% of 
all the petroleum in the entire world. 20%. We use it meaning we're very dependent on it. However, let's shift gears. The Middle East is a major producer of oil. Saudi Arabia produces almost 12 million barrels of oil per day and is nearly about 12% of the world's output. Iraq is the sixth largest producer of oil. The United Arab Emirates, the UAE, is the seventh biggest producer, and Iran is the ninth, and the tiny country of Kuwait is number 10. With the Middle East being the largest producers and the United States being the largest consumers, those economic interests have shaped much of our involvement in the area. OPEC, which stands for the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, is a multinational organization established in 1960 that works together with oil exporting nations to set prices, production, discuss about other issues regarding their assets and reserves. And then there's terrorism. During more recent times, we will see how movements use violence against civilians in efforts to really achieve their political aims. I want to emphatically push back against this idea that somehow terrorism and the religion of Islam are somehow linked because that is false. Islam is a peaceful religion, just like there have been terrorist organizations tied to many other world religions, Christian groups, Buddhist extremism, even Jewish groups, as well as those who exploit the Islamic scriptures. In all of these scenarios, I will argue it is just another instance of people using religion to legitimize their power. And it's about power, and it's not about religion. In the Middle East, we will see the influence of Al Qaeda, which was formed under Osama bin Laden, who is from Saudi Arabia, but was heavily involved in Afghanistan, which is not the Middle East. But he will create his terror organization with those who fought alongside of him when they fought against the Soviets. Now, Al-Qaeda will have an affiliate group that rises in Iraq, known as Al-Qaeda in Iraq, following the U.S. invasion in that area in 2003. And in Syria, there's al Nusra Front. These different groups will mirror much of the animosity bin Laden had towards Western imperialism and will push their agenda of jihad, using terrorism where, again, they attack civilians on purpose for their political goals. The most famous attack from the perspective of the U.S. would be 9-11, as they purposely targeted the Twin Towers and the Pentagon, which were really these symbols of U.S. economic motives and military involvement around the world. Furthermore, the Islamic State will emerge as a splinter group of al-Qaeda in Iraq as they sought to bring back the caliphate in the region of Iraq and Syria, led by Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi they gained a significant portion at one point. It was like one third of Syria and about 40% of Iraq between the years of 2013 to 15. But by 2017, they had lost 95% of their territory that they originally gained. Now in the West, we hear about ISIS terrorist attacks, but I want you to remember that these terrorist attacks primarily were against Iraqi and Syrian civilians. But yes, they also occurred in many other nations around the world, including the United States, including France, and so many others. That was a lot. There is no doubt that this is the longest video in this series, as you have an extensive overview of the Middle East from the beginning of the course all the way to the end. Let's review one last time with the one minute recap from the top. All three monotheistic religions emerged in the Middle East, Islam being the biggest influencer in the area. Baghdad is the center of learning under the Abbasid Empire, which will eventually break apart and eventually collapse as the Mongols conquer it. Remember the horses. But then the Ottomans will rise up and reunify afterwards. Mehmet II will conquer Constantinople. Now it's Istanbul, not Constantinople. Ottomans are successful because of their use of gunpowder, predominantly Sunni. However, the neighbor next door is Shia. Led by the Shah, the Safavids have many conflicts with the Ottomans, religion, land disputes. Now the Safavids collapsed in 1722, new empire, not much in our course about that. Ottomans survive all the way to the end of World War I. They struggle during the Industrial Revolution as Europe is booming and they are trying to keep up. They have the Tanzimat reforms, they have the young Ottomans, they have the young Turks as they try to figure out how to reform and keep up with other nations. They fight alongside the Germans in the Austro-Hungarian Empire during World War I, those young Turks who wanted a unified Turkish identity, and they had Armenians in their empire who were not. We see a genocide occur at their hands. They lose World War I and their region is divided up under the mandate system. It's totally new colonization, but a different name, of course. Now, the British say they support the creation of a Jewish state in Palestine back in 1917. That doesn't totally gain traction until after World War II and the Holocaust. Newly created states by the United Nations creates Israel and Palestine, two new states. People 
already live there. And the Palestinians object. There is lots of fighting between Israelis and Palestinians, and we also have people who are occupying settlements and moving into the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. It's very messy and still goes on today. Egypt gains its independence. Turkey was created. Syria was created. The United States gets all wound up anytime anything is nationalized or seems like it's turning communist because, you know, the Cold War. British and the United States get together and covertly overthrow Mossadegh and Iran as they nationalize their oil industry. Egypt also nationalizes the Suez Canal. Ah, oh, we gotta contain communism. But really, it was the Middle East gaining back their resources. Iran has both the White Revolution, which is this land reform, and the Iranian Revolution, which will shift back to the ideas of Shia Islam and away from Western ideas. Lots of oil, and the U.S. is really dependent. Al-Qaeda and ISIS emerge and are willing to let civilians be the victims of their political goals. What's next? Only time will tell. I sure hope that this was helpful in connecting the dots. Um, please feel free to leave a comment below about what was the most helpful or maybe even better, what was the most confusing, and I can answer those questions for you. Subscribe to the channel, click the bell to be notified the next time a video comes out in this series. I sincerely hope this helped you learn about yesterday so that you can better understand today and we can all write a much better tomorrow. Check out the rest in this series review by region. Otherwise, I do have unit one through nine videos that you can check out to review if you want to stick within a time period and do the little dance and whip around. I for sure will join in the fun and whip you around those regions to help you review what was going on. So thanks again. Good luck. Keep setting and we'll see you next time.